Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll start by saying I, I'm honored to be here. I arrived from Iraq late yesterday afternoon. As a journalist, I used to uh, cover wars, be on the ground, and um, report on the stories of, of people uh, whose lives are shattered and homes are broken and destroyed. Um, having joined IOM, I think I am privileged that I get to see the other side because we journalists sometimes we cover and then we move on and the organizations they take over and they are the ones that on the ground um, help the people um, whose lives have been broken. On two sites in, uh, in Iraq, um, we received uh, recently on Tuesday uh, about 150 families in one go um, out of the blue and these sites had been prepared and you think everything is in place and ready. And then when the internal displaced arrived, you realize that no matter how prepared you are, you are never prepared for, for what they need. Um, new babies were born on the same night, two little boys. Uh, one was called Nader, which means rare. And they're starting life on site or in a camp, basically. And they have a long way to go. Um, it's cold, many of them walked overnight uh, some crossed the river, they arrived drenched, freezing cold, uh, and tired. And they come still with dignity and with honor. Um, they want to go back home. They're there not because they chose to, but because situation made them. Um, some of them perhaps came up to us and said, you know, are you IOM? Um, do you do migration? Can you please send us um, as migrants here, there, and the other? We provide shelter through you, through the help you provide, um, food, um, uh, clothes, warmth, tents, everything. But it doesn't end there. We can't pat ourselves on the back and say that's where it finishes. They need more. Um, they have dignity, they have honor, um, and they want to be something. Uh, they want to make something out of themselves, and they want to contribute. Um, one, young ch one young girl was 20 years old. She was upset because she couldn't finish her exams. And she was telling me that, and she spoke English, and she said, even on this site or this camp, I want to do something. I want to work. I want to help so that I feel I am I'm doing something. I'm not useless. Um, there was a father who arrived with his 11-year-old. He had buried his wife the day before um, because his house was bombed by ISIL. And his young 11-year-old girl was there, and she was like, I want to go back to school. I want to go back home. Um, all I can say is that their tales, their stories are huge. Um, um, it's enormous. Um, what they need um, is beyond what we think and beyond the, the provisions that we do grant them. But uh, perhaps the best, the best people to explain some things are these three guests that we have here um, who have, and, I, and I'll introduce them, um, who have themselves made a journey and, and made something out of their lives. Um, Luis Salinas is um, um, he is born in, he was born in the U.S. and based and and moved and based into in Mexico. He's a movie producer, and one of the films he made was The Golden Dream, which is highly acclaimed. He made it in 2015. Um, the movie is about basically um, teenagers, or as we have now, unescorted children, um, that were making the 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 the, the, the trip, uh, the journey um, from from Mexico to to the United States. Um, Luis. I am, I'm not an expert in, in migration, I've been saying this. Uh, I'm a filmmaker uh, from Mexico, and uh, obviously these people know more about the subject than, than I could ever. Uh, I've met a lot of migrants uh, while making this movie. Um, <clears throat> migrants from Central America, from Mexico, uh, making their way to the US. Uh, I am not a representative of these people, although I am proud to say that I, I know many of them and I, and I am their friend. Um, in the making of this film, which is a, a, um, a fiction film, not a documentary, we, we met uh, a lot of them on the way. I employed on, on the film, I employed about 10 of them uh, from Honduras and um, Nicaragua and Guatemala. Uh, they were making their way to the U.S. Fortunately, they 
they found jobs while they were while they were uh, while we were shooting they they found jobs uh with us and they are currently living in mexico i guess illegally or or if if that's even the term illegal um they they no longer uh ma managed to get to the u.s because they had no need for it these people are looking for jobs and they found the job uh on our set and and some of them uh, keep working for the companies we hired, some of them working in catering companies or in electric, you know, people who move the lights and all that. So now these people um, who have this idea of moving into the U.S., they, they don't. These people just need a job to support their families. That's basically all they need. Uh, in the making of this film, th I think we were supposed to see a trailer, but yeah, we see a trailer. we'll see it later. Okay, you'll see the trailer. Um, uh, we tried making a movie as honest as possible. Uh, it's not a big budget film. Uh, we went to uh, city of Guatemala where were migrants, the, the the slums where they're where where they're from, La Zona Uno, um, and they we 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 interviewed maybe 200, 300 kids uh, just to find our actors. Our actors are not professional actors. These actors are kids uh, that that were not migrants themselves, but had certainly known the subject of migration and the phenomenon, and they were very entwined with it. So on a daily basis while we were shooting this film, we would tell them, we, we, we would never show them the script, we would never tell them, oh, this is a story, uh, this is gonna happen in this scene. So every, every reaction they have is very natural and based basically on what they know because they obviously all have some family member who migrated into the U.S. or who was killed uh, on their way uh, to the U.S. or in the border or just simply disappeared and never, never to be heard of again. So everyone we, we, we had in this film involved was very much enticed with, with, with the subject. Uh, I met a lot of migrants while shooting the film and doing research for the film. Um, and I rode the train with them from across southern Mexico uh, just so we can see if we could actually shoot the film this way. Uh, you know, sort of a documentary style, and we couldn't, of course. But... I rode I rode the train for 12 hours. I mean, that was that was nothing. Uh and I was desperate. I mean, I needed to get off that train just being under the sun for 12 hours with no nowhere to go. Uh can't fall asleep because you might fall off. Uh a uh, a uh, tree might come by and, and and knock you out or hit you in the face. I mean, that that was me. And and I had a hard time with it, of course. So I can I can only imagine what these people, my friends, uh have to do you know crossing the the mexican desert or crossing the mexican the southern part where it's it's even more dangerous because of the cartels because of of uh the the dangerous situation but one thing i did learn is two things and it was the idea that the movie tries to convey is one these people aren't ignorant these are they're not educated of course but these these migrants are are very smart people and and they know that they're not s that they're called um, illegals, but they're not illegal because e migration is not illegal. You know, it's natural. Everyone migrates. Nature migrates. Birds migrate. So these people are not mi uh, these people are not illegal in any part of the world, and they know that, and and they share that dignity amongst themselves. And they have a their little own microcosm. I mean, they they tell jokes that start with with uh, a, a Guatemalan, a Honduran, and, and a Mexican being on a boat. I mean, I, I don't remember the rest of the joke. Um, it's the only things they understand. Because, because sometimes, I guess, uh, for us, uh, or, or for you on, on this side, you get caught up in the numbers. But I've, I've shared these people, I've shared meal with these people, and they're, they're very proud of themselves. Uh, they're very ambitious. And they're very responsible of themselves and and of their family, and um, I guess for them, they know how hard it is. They they know what it is, and, and I can't speak, of course, of migration in the rest of the world, because I'm not an expert on that subject either. Uh, but these people who live in Central America, who live in Mexico, 
their situation in their country is so dire there is zero opportunity for growth zero and there's not little opportunity there's zero opportunity and they rather take their chances and die on a train or die trying to get to whatever they know might be better than to just stay in their country so again i am not an expert in this subject and it's not my responsibility to do something about it so i just did what best i could and just made this movie to share their voice uh, and to convey as best as possible what, it, what, what their story is. So hopefully people whose responsibility there is, I don't know if it's you or if it's somebody else, um, hopefully they'll do something about it because these people are dying and it's not a recent uh, thing. It's, it's, it's been going on and will be going on for a very long time. Thank you, Louis. I think it's a film that we should all make a point of watching at some point. Um, next is Dr. Nong Trans Davis. Um, she's a Canadian physician and author. She's a former refugee from Vietnam. At the age of five, she and her mother and siblings moved to um, a refugee camp in Malaysia where they spent eight months before they were allowed to Canada. I think she's best to tell you her story. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is an incredible honor to be here today before so many who have worked so hard to make our world a better place. Though this is a daunting experience, knowing how at this moment, outside these doors, millions of lives, many of whom are women and children, are displaced by war and conflict and tens of thousands more have perished at sea in this past year alone, I am compelled to be here to speak on their behalf, for I too am a migrant. My story starts nearly 40 years ago when our country, Vietnam, was devastated by years of war. My mother was caring for six children under harsh, oppressive conditions. Seeing no future for us, the only choice for her was to take us out to sea, crammed in a wooden fishing boat with over 300 other refugees desperate to find hope and freedom. Hope for a better future for their children, freedom from war and poverty. I was only five years old then, but I remember the nauseating, suffocating experience being in the belly of a boat that was for two days and two nights thrashed by the angry sea. But we were the lucky ones. Little did we know that the boat that had departed mere minutes before ours had crashed and sank at sea, while their loved ones who stayed behind were left forever wondering what became of their children, their brothers, and their sisters. Our boat made it to Malaysia, to an overcrowded refugee camp. Months passed and no nations wanted us because our mom was a mere seamstress, whittled with six dependent children. We were thought of as a potential burden. Then, after eight long months, much to our relief, Canada accepted us. But when our plane touched down, our mom was afraid to take us off because she was afraid that she would not be able to care for six children in a new land with only a dollar in her pocket. But when we stepped off the plane, when we stepped through the gates, our lives were changed forever. I remember vividly the joy that overwhelmed me when, sorry, when a young girl gave me a doll. I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't plan on that, yeah. When a young girl gave me a doll, that doll came to symbolize the kindness and generosity of so many Canadians. They were our sponsors who, we later learned, 
sought to sponsor a family that no one else wanted. By our side, our sponsors remained through the years to help us settle in this beautiful, new, and often very cold land. Sorry. Sorry. Knowing that we that all we have the hope and freedom, the family and home, and all that we have become is because of our sponsors, kindness, compassion, and generosity. To this day, we live in honor of them. Sorry. I honor them by working hard through school to earn a medical degree. In the 10 years that I have been in practice, I have had the privilege of helping heal thousands of sick and ailing patients. I honor them by enacting my right to speak up to the education system and political leaders in Alberta to ensure excellence in education for hundreds of thousands of children in Alberta. I honor them by founding a registered charity to help pass on the hope and opportunities to thousands of children still living in poverty in my homeland of Vietnam. I honor, I honor them by writing stories to convey the human conditions with proceeds going to help organizations like the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada and eventually the Alzheimer's Foundation and other important causes that would bring hope to thousands. I honor them now by becoming sponsors to two Syrian refugee families, one similar to our family with a single mother and five children. After nearly 40 years, it was my turn to stand at the gate and to give five-year-old Elma a little doll. Our new Muslim friends have since blessed us with their beautiful food and culture. And this year, they will be celebrating their very first Christmas in Canada. But this story is not unique to me, for if you or your family have ever enjoyed movies like Hotel Transylvania or Angry Birds, then you are enjoying one of my niece's work. She is a child of my sister, a migrant. If you have ever admired the interior designs of the Vancouver airport, then you are enjoying one of the works of my nephew, another child of a migrant. I share my story, not because I think I am important. In fact, I think I am rather insignificant. I am a mere vessel for a greater force that transcends space and time. That force is kindness. Its power is not an isolated entity, as I have tried to illustrate. It has direct rippling effect in shaping the course of history and the contours of humanity. It breaks my heart to see barriers erected, refugees rounded up, their suffering disregarded by so many nations. Sometimes in the midst of current conflicts and politics, it is easy for us to become myopic, for us to lose sight of the bigger picture. These walls do not make us safer or richer, but rather poorer poorer in culture, in friendship, and in love. Though my story is of the past, it reflects the dynamics of the present and hopefully gives you a glimpse of what the future holds if every nation planted a seed of kindness 
in the heart of every migrant. Kindness is not an idealism, but a very practical, achievable solution against the cancerous tendencies of war and conflict. You will see that through kindness, compassion, and generosity, one of these migrant children will grow up to heal you when you are sick. He or she will lift you up when you are down and can no longer walk. And they will bring peace to a world that is torn apart. I thank you. What she said just reminded me, many in Iraq on the sites were saying they feel like they are staying in detentions. They have barricades around them and they feel like they are in prison and they do not want to be in prison. They want to either go home or be able to start a new life somewhere and contribute to that life. My next participant is Monzer Iskander. Monzer is a Syrian um, who left Syria during the war, but he went um, to Estonia to uh, further his education, to carry on with his studies. He's um, doing human-computer interaction, and um, he has contributed um, a lot by traveling through uh, schools and universities and explaining cultural, the cultural differences um, um, in Syria and um, showing them about diversity and talking to them about, about Syrian culture. Um, he's also facing quite a lot of um, difficulties sometimes when traveling because people judge him by the passport he carries rather than the human being that he is and what he's able to, to give and, and, and produce and, and achieve. Munzer. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here and to share um, my story with you. So my story go, goes back to a very tiny one-room apartment uh, where I was born to a loved nurse and to attentive accountant. With my younger brother, we grew up in the neighborhoods of the city of Latakia in Syria. Latakia now is a safe city, and in terms of uh, Syria, a safe city means that uh, we get rockets from time to time, and your chances of returning home is higher than other cities. Uh, when the events break down, I was doing my bachelor degree. And it was a shock for all of us. But one thing that helped me and helped many others was uh, the newly born civil society back in Syria that many organizations contributed to, like the AUM and the UNDP. And I was proud to be part of this. I started with a, a workshop with the United Nations Development Program about psychosocial support and continued about in this and other main aspects like peace building. In 2015, I got scholarship uh, for 10 months to study human computer interaction in Estonia. Many ask me why Estonia? On the list that I got to choose between different countries, Estonia has like the most interested uh, subject to study and it was human computer interaction. And I applied and I got an email one day telling me that I, you got a, a scholarship to study in Tallinn, Estonia. And I, it took me five minutes wondering about where Estonia is. And when I went to Google and started reading about their history, I was really like happy that this nation is a self-made nation that, that went through a lot of different occupations, but still made, us, made itself to be now a hub, of a tech hub in Europe. Uh, they gave us Skype and many other wonderful technologies we are using right now. When I reached uh, Estonia, uh, I was blessed that I have uh, electricity, uh, that I have uh, warm water and uh, high-speed internet, and mainly, I was very happy of how peaceful the environment there, how peaceful and calm also the people there. I had the, the pleasure to, to, to be uh, 
a participant in the welcoming program, the interior, the Ministry of Interior with the IOM provides for the uh, newly residents. They teach them about the language, the basics of living there, uh, getting a work, etc. And that's how I learned a bit of all these aspects. I knew from day one that I have 10 months of scholarship, that I will receive this scholarship at the end of this month. I know, I know more that after 10 months, I will have no other way of supporting myself. And uh, my parents in Syria are barely supporting themselves. How could they support me? Yes, it would have been easy to go to any, to the police center and tell them I want to be a refugee, take me in. Actually, many of my Estonian friends were telling me, do it, bring your family, but I am a skilled person for some extent. I'm doing my, my master's degree. Why doing that instead of trying to find a job? And I started applying to tons of shops and eventually I got a job and I got to be, to, to, to finance myself during my stay in, in Estonia. All these 10 months I was looking to June and I was waiting that in June I will apply for my residency and I was so afraid that I might not get this residency for some reason and I might like lose my studies, go back to Syria, or etc. There was like really this, this fear and the first months of my jobs I was really like always afraid of losing the job that I was highly stressed that I start getting panic attacks from time to time when I did anything wrong during my job because it was really like, I, I loved to stay there and I wanted to stay there. As I said, do you, because of their history of uh, these different invasions, they, they are like skeptical when, when, when receiving the news of people coming in to, to their country and many people days and videos you see only bloody people you see ISIS, and everyone thinks when they think about refugees, they think ISIS, they think terrorists, they think something bad go going to happen to their country. Uh, contacting many agencies uh, around uh, Estonia, uh, just I want to help. And one local Estonian uh, NGO called Mondo uh, offered me to be in their contact list in a program called uh, School Visits. So I started going from one school to another around Estonia, and I met around like 200 students. Where I showed him, a, I showed them a bit how Syria would look like when it's not ruins, and when it's people not underneath these ruins, when Syrians are happy, when Syrians are doing their daily life as normal people. I told them I was I'm not here to advocate for refugees, or I'm not telling you to accept them or take them in. I'm just trying to tell you that. Syrian people are just normal. We have good people and bad people, as many other different countries. And th the response were amazing. After each class, I have like some students asking me, how can we help? And my, my reply was simple, just stay as you are, open-minded and skeptical of everything you get. Understand and, and, and read people from the, your experience, not from what you hear. Nowadays, if you have a Syrian passport, you are either, in the eyes of many, you are either a tourist or you are a possible refugee. Whenever I'm going to travel, due to work, I'm always having, again, this panic attacks that I'm going to give this passport to this person. He's going to see Syria, and I'm, I'm going to see in his eyes how he's going to, to, to have this fear. I'm not, I'm not sad with him. I'm not angry with him. I understand that this is something normal. What I'm sad about is that I can give this bad effect to someone, that someone is feeling uncomfortable because of me. And this is like, yesterday I was waiting on a long line on a way uh, to, to, to like get my passport checked and go on to plane, and my, my friend was asking me, can we speak? And I told him, do you want to spread panic? Someone speaking in Arabic in a long queue, it's like, nowadays, like, what, yeah, I will, Whatever I will speaking, they will hear their own words. Again, it's not the people, it's, it's the media around us. I don't at, at all like blame any of us because if eventually this is our brains bringing the short memories we got. It's not about what we think of, it's what we act after we have this. So thank you very much. This is in total my story, my 
immigration story and of course there are a lot to speak about but this is the highlight of it thank you very much if there are any questions please Louis regarding your very powerful film which opened the IOM Film Festival on Tuesday um, the name of the film is the golden dream but you explained to us that the actual original name is the golden cage and that this has a lot of significance for migrants that they're going somewhere that is a dream irregular migrants in particular but they when they get there it turns out not always to be the dream it turns out to be something different maybe you could elaborate a little bit um, yeah the the film originally in Spanish is called La Jaula de Oro which means the golden cage uh, it's a it's a term that applies for these migrants, especially you know uh, the ones coming from Central America and Mexico to the U.S. Uh, and it applies to them because they, it's it's a very old term actually. Uh, you live in the U.S. and everything is beautiful and golden and, and and wonderful. However, it's a cage because these people, even even if they are in a safe place, even if they are. Uh, away from the dangers they they have at home, they still, I mean, they, they can't leave their house. They can't. I mean, they go from their from wherever they work um, to home, uh, staring at the ground. Uh, they have no friends outside their their own circle. They can't speak to people. Uh, they if they have a car, they have to be extremely careful because you know. If if they if they run a light or whatever accident or even by no fault of their own if they're involved in an accident they'll get stopped they'll get deported and I've 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 heard so many of these migrants uh, on the way saying that they that live in in the U.S. in Washington or in wh wh whichever city and they were kicked out for the for the for the dumbest reason possible. Uh, for jaywalking, someone saw them because they got into a fight with an American uh, for whatever idiotic reason. Uh, their 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 eye was set on them, and they were just kicked back. They never got to see their family again. Their wife, their kids, uh, were went to school. The parent went to 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 work, and then all of a sudden he got deported. And he's been, they have been, you know, trying over and over to get. To their family back and there's no communication either so um, the hardship of the journey does not end when they cross the border and when they live in the US it's 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 a terrible situation while they live there and uh, obviously it's a very political issue the US government is is very is not very fond of helping out uh, migrants and especially not now so I mean even now these people are are having um, people that 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 have made the objection, have made the 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 way into the U.S. They're still having quite the trouble as it was now, uh, as it was before. And now I think uh, situation is obviously going to become worse for them. Director General. Thank you very Just much. Wanted no, I'm to record the thanks of all of us for for all four of you for taking the time to come and be with us and share your stories. And you all have a very rich uh, life's experience to share with us. And maybe to ask you a question, we have outlined basically two overarching challenges in trying to improve uh, the lot of migrants when they move. Uh, one is to try to change the public discourse about migration from a very almost poisonous narrative right now to one that is historically more accurate, namely that migrants historically have always made overwhelming contributions to all our societies. And secondly, to try to uh, basically say that the what we have to learn is how to um, get people to embrace, not, not just to accept, but to embrace diversity as a... Um, uh, a rich element in society rather than something that uh, that is negative. Uh, any of you have any thoughts on how, how we might and you might together, how we might do this better, more effectively? I think, uh, I think uh, 
uh, Lewis, your your film, The Golden Dawn, which I didn't get to see the whole of the other night, but I will see. Uh, and we have a whole you might we have a whole migrant film festival going on now, and we we led off with Lewis film at the Geneva Center uh, on um, uh, 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 two nights ago. Um, that's one way we've got the I am a migrant campaign that Leonard uh, uh, Doyle and 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 his people are running. Uh, we have the social media campaigns we're using, but any other thoughts you'd like to share with us would, would be helpful. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things I've always done is go on the ground and listen to people on the ground. And I think there's no better way than, than understanding what is going on by actually hearing it from their mouths themselves. And perhaps that's what, what, that's what we should do more of. Um, I don't know, you may have some different, Dr. Dr. Nong, anything? Um, in, in Canada, you know, Canada is very accepting with diversity and, and helpful with refugees. Um, but locally, you know, in the community, I, I still hear, you know, the odd person post on Facebook or other uh, media sites uh, uh, about, you know, their fears that uh, the, the refugees would, um, you know, there would be terrorists among them. And so there are, is still, there are fears in Canada as well. And so to counter some of those friends that, that post negative things, um, in, instead of, I suppose, instead of debating them and engaging them in, in, um, in uh, discussions or, um, you know, um, uh, arguments uh, as to what the the, fa the facts are because they they will believe what they want to believe but I think my tactic has been to to counter it with you know the images of the families that we had sponsored uh, to show them that you know the children are, are just thrilled to be going to school and that they have um, engaged in the community and gone Halloween you know trick-or-treating or, -treating or um, that they will be celebrating Christmas and such and to show them the positive side of of um, the, the refugees and how much they want to integrate into our community, how much they want to be a part, how grateful they are for the opportunities they have. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, 35,000 refugees have, have arrived in Canada and then there's been no uh, negative incidents. Like with time, I think it will grow upon people that um, that you know, people are are, um, are 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 good and kind, and and all they want is to have peace and to have, um, y have yeah, safety. Monzer, you'd like to add something? I think, um, as you mentioned, that we have too many immigrants that we can barely count, and I believe we need to stop counting them and start counting on them. <laughs> I believe that, that uh, my, my, f my brother is in Germany, he's a refugee. He, unlike me, didn't take it by a plane, he took it by a rubber boat. And he's now like, w would like to get a job, which is sometimes hard. So I believe this, like if we can support in any way being self-independent and having a shop could help be helpful a lot to integrate into the society. Thank you. India. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, Mr. Iskandar. Um, uh, what what we feel about Syria? Syria was a country which has provided highest number of travel documents to Palestinians to work beyond. Uh, uh, and all over the world. So it, it, we see Syria as a, a classic example of multicultural, multi-ethnic and uh, a country with rich history and diversity. And also the people uh, are very open and uh, minded. They, they are still today the top class uh, uh, engineers, doctors, experts, lawyers and uh, religious scholars are Syrians. Uh, what we feel is that uh, this uh, political uncertainty and uh, the conflict due to crisis which has been uh, which has created hardship for Syrian uh, should end as early as possible and uh, people who have vision like you should return back f for rebuilding Syria. Uh, uh, the only challenge which I see is that once the reconstruction rebuilding of Syria starts in near future whether the people the experts who have depopulated that land will ever like to return back because they want to see their middle mid-term and long-term future uh, uh, which may or may not be stable in Syria. 
so that is one of the challenge which I want to uh, understand that what is your perspective on that and uh, so far as the uh, reasons for migration of people from this uh, area is concerned, I have uh, opportunity to uh, stay in Irbil for uh, two months, uh, in December and January. And what I personally found is that quite a large number of particularly the experts who have better opportunity to get integrated beyond the boundaries of Syria and Iraq, they were more desperate to move because they did not see any uh, uh, immediate future for them in these two countries. And for them, the chances of their set, set, settling up and establishing themselves in other parts of the world was much easier. So what I found that the best surgeons, the best doctors, the best engineers, they were, they were also uh, uh, moving out in large numbers. Uh, so this is just my observation I thought I should share with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I call on the U.S. Representative um, Ann Richardson? I um, want to thank all members of the panel because it strikes me that you are all actively working to change perceptions about migrants in a very, very positive and constructive way. Um, and um, very touched about um, some of your stories uh, and about where you are and what you're doing and how you're trying to uh, help. Uh, it was mentioned that the U.S. Uh, doesn't care about migrants, and I want to make sure that it's clear that the U.S. does indeed. In addition to resettling refugees and providing overseas assistance, we are the top donor to the International Organization of Migration. And just uh, the presence of our delegation here today shows that we are engaged and we do care. I do think, though, that uh, there's also a question, though, about how well the U.S. handles undocumented uh, economic migrants who approach our borders. We, with many others here, support uh, the humane treatment of migrants, whether they are authorized to cross borders or whether they are undocumented. I think it's very important that we look carefully at the situation in uh, our hemisphere, which um, this film, the, the Golden Dream, helps us to do, to understand, uh, and to consider what can be done to avoid the dangers of this journey especially for unaccompanied children. Uh, we really want to make sure that uh, all that migration and legal channels of migration is a benefit to all and not a uh, danger to innocent people. Uh, I also appreciate that the panel has uh, raised some of these issues of the need to protect migrants and also um, something that is a, a charged discussion right now in my own country, how um, some commentators are mixing uh, perceptions of who migrants are, who refugees are, and who terrorists are, and mistakenly associating uh, innocent people with terrorism. So we're, we join you in trying to get out the word that these are, uh, especially in, the, in, the, in terms of the Syrian refugees and refugees from other war zones, that these are the victims of terrorism. These are not uh, terrorists. And um, that, that message can't be um, said enough times uh, in these particular days. Finally, I'm very struck by our colleague from Canada how part of her story is that her family has turned around to sponsor a Syrian family. I think this is such a, a moving um, testimony you've given us today, and I hope you will continue to tell your story and publicize your story of being a family of refugees who turned around to help uh, another family. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Assistant Secretary Anne Richard. 
and uh, indeed to the distinguished delegate from India. I'm also going to nakedly plug the I Am A Migrant platform, which is where we discover some of these voices. And we really encourage all of you to, to encourage people to participate in the platform. It's not about IOM. It's about the stories of migrants uh, in all shades. And we, we certainly don't censor them. And we want these voices to be heard and to populate the media.